Thank you. Sorry, I'm not that tall. Harshe Tuhi, Kanakraka, Charlene Nijme, Wetresh Muwekma Wolwulum, San Francisco Bay Area Tak. Hello, my name is Charlene Nijme, and I am the chairwoman of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco and Oakland Bay Area. Today, as we get as we come together for Robert F. Kennedy's announcement of his VP running, presidential running mate, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the East Bay, Karkin, Huchun, Halgin, Irgin, Ohlone-speaking tribal groups of the Alameda and Contra Costa counties, whom were intermarried with the Yalamu, Aramai, San Francisco, Costanoan Ohlone speaking groups of the San Francisco Peninsula. These are the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This Greater Bay Region's Aboriginal territory includes the unceded, unsurrendered lands of the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe who are the successors of the historic, sovereign, federally recognized, and never terminated Verona Band of Alameda County. This, this land was and continues to be of great historic significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, and our people are still here today. Where we stand right here in the city of Oakland is part of our 10,000 year historical homeland. Yet the Mawekma Ohlone tribe is still not federally recognized as an official tribe today, despite its existence in fact. This wrong must be made right and we know a leader like Mr. Kennedy will take up our cause. It is time we stop the continued political erasure of the forgotten tribes of California and others across the country. There are 80,000 members of unrecognized tribes in California and hundreds of thousands more across the United States in places like North Carolina, Michigan, Georgia, Virginia, Louisiana, Minnesota, Oregon, Washington, Alabama, and Tennessee, who all can continue to suffer from the oppression of the corrupt system that favors special interest money over social, racial, and historical justice. Our people are suffering. We need leaders with ethical and moral courage that Robert Kennedy Jr. has. In order to stand up for what is just and what is right, Robert Kennedy Jr. has protected the rights of indigenous people for over 40 years, and we believe in him to build on that legacy. We believe that he can and will help bring prosperity to Indian country and restore the trust between it, the first Americans and the United States government. That's why I am proud to announce that the Muwekma Ohlone Tribal Council has passed a unanimous resolution to endorse Robert F. Kennedy for the President of the United States. We know that this is a pivotal moment in our history and for this country. 
and that Robert Kennedy Jr. is that person to lead us into a brighter future. Change won't magically come to our people. It must be fought for, pushed for, and sometimes even bled for. Bobby Kennedy's father fought for us. His uncle fought for us, and they both bled for us while reaching for justice on so many fronts, and justice was nearly within their grasp. Mr. Kennedy, my people are praying for you. We're praying that you will continue to have the courage to speak the truths that bring justice to all peoples. And in this moment of pronounced political polarization, we pray for your safety and protection. I ask. I ask all my indigenous brothers and sisters, this election year, don't sit this one out. Fight for your freedom. Fight for your justice. And fight for Bobby Kennedy. The way that he has always fought for us. My heart, my breath, and my spirit are with you all. Thank you so much. Hoshetruhi, Kanakraka, Joey, Kanahini, Dolores Sanchez, Julia Lopez, Geraldine Lopez. My name is Joey Iolopishli, a member of the Moak Maloney. I come from the descendants of Julia Lopez, Dolores Sanchez, and Geraldine Lopez. In the physical and in the spiritual, we understand that protection is must. Our children, we protect them. Our mothers, as we're born, protect our children. I'm here to sing a song so we can put that protection on our relatives and all and to help help this fight for justice. <clears throat> These songs were borrowed and taught to me by allies of our Miwok, Nisanon people, Razzle Dazzle, and Zaya. Blessings, Hoshe Chuhi. California, Northern California, can I hear it? Oh, oh, hear it louder. We need to raise the ancestors. Can I hear it? Oh, 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 sure, you have a good day. Today is a beautiful day.
Hello, Oakland! How are you all doing today? My name is Del Bigtree. I'm the Director of Communications for the Robert Kennedy Jr. Campaign for President of the United States. I just want to take a moment to say what an honor it is to work with one of the most beautiful people on this planet. One of the greatest environmental attorneys the world has ever known, fighting for people his entire career against corporate corruption, corporate toxins, polluting waters and oceans. He started the river keepers and the water keepers to protect our environment. We now live in a toxic world. Over 260 toxic poisons found just in the umbilical cord of pregnant women here in the United States of America. And why are they there? Because our regulatory agencies have never done their job to protect us, but instead have been protecting the corporations from us. That is not the United States of America. That is not we, for, and by the people of America. And we've watched over the last several years, two incumbent presidents really, and here we are, watching trillions of dollars move to the ultra-rich while the middle class struggles to pay our bills, to go on vacation, to have that pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And now we have an opportunity. Someone that is blowing all of our minds when he talks about all of the issues of our time. So many of the cameras that are lined up here today will call and ask, you know, what is your strategy? We know that mainstream news has been trying to black him out, but yet he's now number one amongst independents across the United States of America, which is now the largest party in the United States of America. That's how disenfranchised we are. Number one amongst those under the age of 35 across America. And why? What was the strategy? I'm going to lay it on you right now. It was actually very simple. We're going to let him speak his mind. He's going to speak in long-form podcasts and interviews, giving the full concept of where his ideas are coming from. He's not stuck on bumper sticker politics short lines written by other people. I can tell you personally that everything he's saying comes from his heart, his education, his historical knowledge, which we're all watching happen in all of these interviews he's been doing. And so if you haven't been watching Robert Kennedy Jr. at Kennedy24.com, or if your family members don't know who he is yet, have them go to his YouTube channel, or Twitter, or Facebook, or TikTok, where he is changing the world as we know it. We in America are so tired of the duality, of the fighting between two parties, when we know we've got such important issues now, AI technologies, facial recognition softwares, our cell phones can track everywhere we're going, and they tried to use that against us during the COVID pandemic. They wiped out our freedom of speech, censored Robert Kennedy Jr., and he brought a case against our nation because of it. We watched doctors and scientists silenced at the critical moment they should have been using social media for what it was, to share ideas and thoughts and experiences from the front line of that experience. And instead, we silenced them, shut them down, and stuck with the regulatory agency experts that told us that standing six feet apart from each other, locking down our businesses, keeping our children out of schools was how we were going to handle this only to find out now in front of the Congress when Tony Fauci says, yeah, that social distancing thing, that six feet apart, that just kind of popped up and had no basis in science. The same man that said to us, when you challenge me, you challenge the science. Never before have we seen science owned, science stuck in its path, science so incapable of going through the scientific method of letting every scientist speak out, everyone challenge the process until we come up with the real answers. 
That regulatory capture of our regulatory agencies, that corporate corruption that owns our government will only stop in the hands of one man, Robert Kennedy Jr. So tell your friends, tell your families, if we're actually gonna handle the issues of our time, if we're gonna get out of these wars that are taking trillions of dollars from us, destroying our economy for wars that never end, if we're going to stop that, we need someone bold, someone beautiful, someone that has stood up for us, for us from the beginning. That's Robert Kennedy Jr. I'm so honored to have you all here in Oakland. This is the next step in what's been just an incredible, miraculous journey. Robert Kennedy Jr. will be on the ballot in all 50 states and every single one of these news agencies, every one of these news agencies that keeps doing pieces about Joe Biden and Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Donald Trump, it's so close, who's gonna take it? No one talking about the elephant in the room. The guy that's polling between 24 to 26 percent in the battleground states with still much of the nation saying, I didn't even know he's running yet. My news agencies are lying to me. Well, guess what? That's all about to change. Mark my words. We're going to be on the ballot. That's going to happen shortly. And every news agency that lied to their audience and said this is a two-person race, they're going to have to change their tune. And they're going to have to start talking to Robert Kennedy Jr. And let me just tell you the last part. The last part of our strategy is simple. What we've recognized in the polls, what we've recognized is Robert Kennedy Jr. has traveled across America, is really simple. Once you've heard Robert Kennedy Jr., you can't unhear Robert Kennedy Jr. Are you ready for a miracle to happen? Are you ready for another voice? in this political system? Are you tired of the two-party stranglehold on truth and freedom and liberty? Get ready, because we're going to announce today the question that everyone in media has been asking. And it sounds a little bit like this. Well, it looks like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is just about ready to make headlines with his running mate choice. He is ready to announce who his VP will be, and according to reporting, it's not any of the usual suspects. Both Democrats and Republicans growing anxious over the third party threat as RFK is set to formally announce his vice presidential running mate. RFK Jr. hoping for a big boost this week as well when he announces his VP pick. Our independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. expected to announce his running mate this week. We are expected to get an RFK Jr. vice presidential announcement. Well, number one, RFK Jr., the former Democrat turned independent last year. He wanted to run for president of the United States as an independent. And on the ballot in a good number of states, you've got to uh, make an announcement about who your running mate is going to be. Independent candidate for president Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he plans to announce his vice presidential running mate here in Oakland on March 26. Are these names just getting people's attention or is one of them a real possibility, Marianne? I, I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but I have a story to tell, and I think it's one that a lot of you will relate to. 2015 was an extremely challenging year in my house. I was experiencing a wide range of symptoms, including rashes and neur neuropathy and some eye issues. At the same time, my son had crippling migraines 
and ADHD. My daughter had digestive issues that were making her so miserable. All of us were on various medications, none of which were particularly helpful, and actually in my case made things considerably worse. So, like most moms, and I know many of you are here today, I decided to start digging through the research and figuring out what is making our family so sick. So I read an entire library of functional medicine books, and I ran some tests and found that we had severely imbalanced microbiomes, and our nutrient levels were extremely low, even though we were eating all this food. So I wondered what on earth has changed so much in our food system that my kids and I can no longer tolerate gluten, nor have the fundamental nutrients that our cells need to function on a basic biological level. How could that possibly be? We were feeling better off the gluten, but this just didn't make sense. It's not just my family that's struggling with these issues. The United States spends over $4 trillion on health care. Most of that goes towards chronic disease. Today, six in 10 adults have a chronic disease. Four out of 10 have two or more. 9% of men and 11% of women of childbearing years are infertile. That should be very scary. The, the statistics are also incredibly dim for children. One in 10 has ADHD. One in six has asthma. One in three has a food intolerance. One in five has eczema. One in 20 has seizures. And one in 22 in the state of California has autism. That should be horrific. That number in 1970 was one in 10,000, by the way. What the government, media, and universities won't discuss is that our food supply is literally covered in carcinogenic, endocrine-disrupting, microbiome-destroying pesticides. Our farmlands have become a dumping ground for toxic chemicals that our regulators either refuse to test or they do test and then they lie about what they found. The pharmaceutical giant Bayer purchased the agricultural chemical company Monsanto in, 20, in 2018. Yeah. And so now a pharmaceutical company effectively owns our food supply. So I have to ask you, what incentive does Bayer possibly, possibly have to keep our population healthy? This is the same old story of the prioritization of corporate profits and bureaucratic power over our basic right to human health. It's enabled by full regulatory capture of our food and farming system, and it must stop immediately, and Bobby Kennedy's the only person who can do it. Yeah. Our farm bill has historically supported monocrop chemical mega farming. We absolutely urgently need to pass a farm bill supporting family farmers, regenerative agriculture practices, and nutrient-dense crops beyond the clutches of the Roundup-ready GMOs that are making us all sick. We will not decrease the $4 trillion health bill until we regenerate the soil on our farms cut the ties between regulators and corporations, and discontinue our toxic chemical dependency on both the farm and the pharmacy. <laughs> Kennedy's promise to unravel corporate capture will help end this chronic disease epidemic. We finally have a leader who shares my vision for the future. Bobby Kennedy is the only candidate who will make this life-saving transformation of our food and farming system a reality, tell corporations, by the way, your reign over regulators is over, and deliver the basic right to health back to the hands of the United States citizens. Thank you.
Mr. Kennedy, Bell created all this. Bell Scott. Well, hey, Welcome, Mr. Kennedy. This this beautiful farm, which is an organic farm in the middle of a uh, what people would call a blighted community. The things that we're dealing with as black people in our community, this is a result of racism, redlining, all those different things that kept our communities at ill health. The food is sick that our community is getting because it's coming from big ag. The African-American communities are food deserts. You cannot get good food here. You look at what black kids are eating. They're drinking big gulp Coca-Colas and they're eating Twinkies and processed foods. Mr. Kenny's uh, presence and what he's talking about is a perfect example about what we need to do ourselves. He's taking a personal commitment to fight. You got to fight for your land, you fight for your business, you fight for everything that's of interest to you. We not only have to give people access to healthy food, but we need to just get rid of all the bad food. The, the, the chemical food, it's not, it's not food, it's just filler with poison in it. I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I'm running for President of the United States and I approve this message. Hold your horses, we're moments away. I just want to bring your attention to these screens over here. We have a QR code for everyone that is hearing impaired, whether you're live in the audience or you're out watching this uh, live stream as it's happening, just scan this QR code and that will take you to the hearing impaired um, section so you can see everything typed out uh, for you. The next guest is a personal hero of mine and really should be considered a hero in the world. When there was a small group of scientists, as I said before, you know, basically lying about what would work, deciding to lock down our nation for the first time in history because of a virus. There was a group of people that went to the White House to talk to President Trump at that time to bring a different perspective that was shared by thousands and thousands of health experts across the world. They wrote a document called the Great Barrington Declaration. A document that will stand the test of time and be heralded as the path the world should have taken. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce you to one of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, Jay Bhattacharya. Never given a speech at a political rally, but my God. You, <laughs> uh, I, first, I want to thank uh, Mr. Kennedy for the opportunity to speak today is in, on this important day in American history. And I wanted to take the chance to make a case for the First Amendment and for free speech. I, I, know, I know that Bobby Kennedy has been the, the victim of an effort to censor his voice. And I have to say that I've been the victim of, of this same effort to censor free speech in this country. I, I, I'm a, I am a scientific dissident. I've been a professor at the School of Medicine at Stanford for over 20 years. The Great Barrington Declaration, how many people signed it? God bless every one of you. It, it was a document I wrote with professors at Harvard and Oxford in October of 2020. The world was locked down. We had closed our schools. We had closed our businesses. We had closed our churches on the idea that it was necessary for our health. But I knew for a fact that that was a lie, that there were tens of thousands of doctors and scientists who said that we didn't need to lock down. We didn't need to close our schools. We didn't need to close our businesses. We didn't need to close our churches. We proposed instead better protecting vulnerable older people. We proposed not disrupting the lives of our children. Following similar ideas, the Swedish Public Health Authority protected human life much better than Americans. In fact, they have among the very best outcomes in protecting human life during the pandemic without lockdowns, without disrupting the lives of our children. Their kids, their kids suffered no learning loss at all during the pandemic. Their elderly were protected better, and their young people 
lived as close to a normal life as possible. Locked down California, my kids didn't see the inside of a classroom for a year and a half. Florida opened its, its schools and they have higher life expectancy and better outcomes, economic outcomes, psychological outcomes, and health outcomes than California did lockdown. The sad, the sad thing I want to share with you is that, that the, the powers that be inside the federal government decided they did not like our declaration one bit. The head of the NIH wrote to Tony Fauci four days after he wrote it calling for a devastating takedown, a devastating takedown of the, of the, of the, uh, the declaration and of me. It was part of a broad federal effort to censor any critics. The way the government censored voices uh, is by telling social media platforms who, and, uh, who to censor and what ideas to censor. If you've had a post taken down by Facebook, if you've had a post taken down by, uh, by Twitter uh, during the, the pandemic, it's almost certain it's because the government actors, the Surgeon General's Office, the CDC, the NIH, the, even the FBI, and the White House itself, with telling social media companies to censor you. The, the good news is we now know what they're up to. We know how they did it and why they're doing it. And we can fight back. We have, we have the Twitter files which told us what they were doing. We have court cases. A federal judge declared what they were doing an Orwellian ministry of truth. An it's the kind of thing that should never happen in a country with the First Amendment, but it did. So, what's the punchline? Free speech is essential for our health. Free scientific... We need dissidents, we need dissident voices in public health because they're very often right. The, go the government censored because it knew it was wrong. It kn we need people like Bobby Kennedy and any other politician that wants to support free speech, we need those voices to get to, to restore the First Amendment in this country. Because that, that is how we protect our health and how we protect our democracy. You know, I work in public health and I don't believe that public health should be political. So I'm, I'm deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> I wanna say public health should be suitable equally for Democrats, for Republicans, for independents, everyone alike. It's something I think we can all as Americans get behind. And so I am glad to work with anybody who speaks for free speech at a time like now when they are in peril. And I'm delighted that Bobby Kennedy has lent his considerable voice to the cause. Thank you very much. I feel like the whole country needs to know what's going on here. It's bigger than alarming. This is the worst I've ever seen it. I witnessed this dystopian nightmare of this uncontrolled flow of desperate humanity crossing the border and converging here because of misbegotten policies by high leadership of the United States. When uh, President Biden took office, he signed some executive orders that basically halted all wall construction. It put our agents at risk. It put the migrants at risk. It incentivized the profit making for the smugglers. At the end of the day, this is a business. Billions and billions of dollars every month are earned from transporting people across into the United States. These kids are being exploited all along this track. There's nothing humane about any of this. In this room, obviously, we, we designed it to be as comfortable as we can possibly make it because the reality is no child should ever have to come to this exam room. <laughs> No, no sé dónde está. 
to stop them. We see a lot of violence as people are making across the border through Mexico or their countries. We see that devastation in, in the human lives. What happens if the if, uh, family doesn't have the money to buy the plane ticket? Uh, well, FEMA reimburses us. We can we can buy that ticket and and. Uh, so you it? buy the ticket for us. Yes. Them. They were told they get a buy the American dream here, and um, that dream becomes a nightmare along the journey. Yuma, Arizona, Chris Clem. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Clem, and I retired as the Chief Patrol Agent of Yuma, Arizona on December 31st, 2022, after serving more than 27 years as a United States Border Patrol Agent. I spent many years along the southern border, I have witnessed the good, the bad, and the ugly of what can happen with poor policies and lack of leadership out of Washington, D.C. Last year, I met Bobby when he came to Yuma. I spent time with him and his campaign. We discussed the realities of the border. Not only did he spend time with me, but as you saw in the video, he saw firsthand hundreds of people from around the world coming into the United States illegally at all hours of the day and night tying up the hands of our agents while the cartels profited off human exploitation. He met with the mayor, the sheriff, the county commissioner, the hospital staff, nonprofit organizations, the food bank, the domestic violence shelter, the ranchers and the farmers, everyone who has been impacted by an out of control border. I was amazed that someone of his position, his stature, spent three days listening and learning, not just checking a box in a photo op. As we spoke, he asked great questions, but most importantly, he listened. And as we talked, I, I shared my vision of border security. And as a career law enforcement agent, it was important to me that he understood how necessary it was to secure our borders, how critical and how part of an integral part of our immigration system border security is. But oftentimes, border security and immigration get conflated, and that leads to further division and rhetoric. So I shared my vision of how the border should be, and that we should be a border made of tall fences and wide gates. The tall fences represented the border security system, the right infrastructure where it is needed, the technology to aid and assist our border security agents along the border and at the ports personnel to conduct our very important security mission and backed by strong policies. But equally important, equally important were the wide gates. The wide gates are our legal and lawful pathways into the United States. Strong and effective policies to allow those to come legally more efficiently to enhance and strengthen our commerce, to allow trade and travel to flourish, clear up the enormous backlog for those who are following the rule of law, more efficient means so people can come in who want to add to our way of life. People shouldn't wait years or a lifetime to be able to come to our country for the right reasons. And if our current workforce cannot provide the means for businesses, big or small, we need a better way to recruit and attain foreign workers without bankrupting small business with overregulated, antiquated systems. I believe Bobby sees this problem as an opportunity. He saw firsthand how important it was to secure our border. He saw the need to clean up the current immigration system. And I know living along the border for many years that a secure border is a safe and healthy border for both countries. That people should be able to come back and forth through the ports of entry to see family and friends and feel safe when doing so. And as someone who's been around the world like Bobby, he knows working together with Mexico will be key. Being a beacon of hope for all of those around the world is a tenet of our country, but so is the rule of law. So consequences are necessary for those that take advantage of our system and the people along the way. 
And no doubt, I believe he knows transparency and accountability of our government is important to regain the trust and credibility of the American people. As I said a moment ago, I met Bobby last year, and I've grown to know that he sees these challenges through a compassion, a compassionate and common sense lens, which is so desperately needed today. Taking clear, kind, and common sense action by creating tall fences to protect our country from the human exploitation at the hands of the cartels, protecting our country, our companies, our communities, and our children, and building many wide gates to better serve our country's needs and the good people around the world. Helping all that seek a better life for them and their families is important. Our country cannot afford to go down the current border security and immigration path. There is strength and compassion, and there is intelligence and common sense, and I see all of this in Bobby. I'm grateful to know him, and we're all grateful to have him running for President of the United States. Thank you. Everybody, I'm back, but I'm only here for a quick second, and it's just to introduce someone else who is so very important. We have a very important speaker coming up next. The name is Callie Means, and I love the last name because this guy means so much to us. He is actually the co-founder of TrueMed, and TrueMed is what we need in our lives to understand about the food and the pharma companies. He was a consultant for food and pharma companies earlier in his year, and now he is an advocate for changing the incentives for our sick care system, which profits from more Americans being sick. Guys, without further ado, Callie Means. Working for the food and pharma industries early in my career, my job was to funnel money to institutions that Americans trust. We funneled money to civil rights groups. In return, the NAACP said it was imperative to keep Coca-Cola on food stamps. They actually said it was racist to take ultra-processed food and soda off of food stamps. And today, soda is the number one item purchased with that program. We funneled money to medical organizations. The American Diabetes Association of all groups took millions of dollars from Coca-Cola, and they said small cans of the drink was a good choice for diabetics. The American Academy of Pediatrics, 80% of their funding comes from the pharmaceutical industry. We funneled money to researchers. I was shocked as a junior employee to be communing with top professors at Harvard and Tufts Nutrition School. I found that 11 times more funding comes from the food industry for nutrition research than the NIH. I found out that more than 50% of the Harvard Med School budget touches pharma in some way. We funneled money to the media. Pharma funds over 50% of all TV news funding, and I realized that wasn't to influence consumers, that was to influence the, the news itself. That's why during COVID, which was essentially a foodborne illness, this was a, really a condition that did not kill metabolically healthy people. There was no curiosity, no reporting on that. Of course, it was just a pharmaceutical solution that was talked about. We funded politicians. The healthcare industry funds politicians with direct donations, 5x more than the oil industry, 3x more than any other industry. And we funded the regulatory agencies. The FDA itself, 75% of their funding comes not from taxpayers, but pharmaceutical companies. And I can tell you from being in DC, bureaucracies are built to grow. Our system is rigged. And the disastrous ramifications are plain to see. Nine of the 10 killers of Americans are tied to preventable chronic conditions tied to food. 90% of healthcare costs are tied to these preventable conditions tied to food. The statistics are unfathomable. 50% of young adults are overweight or obese. 33% of young adults have prediabetes. 25% of young adults have fatty liver disease. This is a moral stain on our country. The childhood obesity rate in Japan is 4%. We're committing genocide against our children. Why is the healthcare system letting this happen? 
There's one simple reason. Every single institution that impacts your health is incentivized for you to be sick and incentivized against you being healthy. That includes medical schools, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and hospitals. An unemotional statement of economic fact is that there has been no more profitable invention in the history of American than a sick child, than a child with chronic disease. They suffer and rack up more comorbidities and more interventions, but they don't die. They just suffer. Today, STANS, metformin, antidepressants, Adderall, they're prescribed like candy in high schools. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recently put out a press release saying it's an urgent national priority to prescribe Ozempic to 50% of 12-year-olds. This is a lifetime drug. This is a story of optimism. The American people want to be healthy. They want their kids to be healthy. They want to thrive. The incentives are stacked against us. They've been stacked against us quickly, and they can change quickly with leadership. We need a president who questions the science, that doesn't just trust the science. We need a president who realizes that this devil's bargain between the food industry making us sick and the healthcare industry profiting is the biggest issue we face. We need a president who has the moral clarity to appoint Dr. J to lead our medical policies, to appoint Kelly Peterson to oversee our agriculture policies. We need a president who will stand up to pharma lobbyists, who will stand up to corrupt bureaucrats at the NIH and the FDA. We need a president who will say less Ozempic, more exercise, less SSRIs, more sunlight and healthy food. We need a president who has the moral clarity to declare a state of emergency for the childhood chronic disease epidemic that is savaging our human capital. And we need a president who realizes we've talked about childhood disease so much. This is the most important issue in our country. And we need a president who understands that we cannot poison our kids at scale. And we need a president that has a plan to fix it. We need a Kennedy in the White House. Thank you. A group that control I've sued NIH, CDC, EPA, FCC, FDA, all of them. I've brought many, many suits against the Department of Agriculture. The USDA represents and promotes the interests of big factory farms, of industrial agriculture, of big companies like Monsanto, Cargill, Tyson's, Purdue, and, and the big petroleum fertilizer companies, in other words, the oil companies. And they really, USDA operates full time to punish and destroy the small farmer in this country and to promote the mercantile interest of these big uh, industrial agricultural interests. Americans can see the corruption and we all have this feeling that this system has been rigged against the American middle class. They're strip mining the wealth from the American people and, and destroying the health of our children and causing this chronic disease epidemic that is the biggest blight on the American middle class in our country and that it's, it's being used to benefit this oligarchy, this new corporate kleptocracy. Let's give another warm welcome to Tim Hockenberry. As I went walking That ribbon of high I saw above me in the skyway, saw below me the golden valley. Oh, this land was made when I roamed and rambled, followed my footsteps to the dark and sand. Diamond is 
shut me up that long because now I'm going to really let loose on them for the next 18 months. They're going to hear a lot from me. We've used our editorial judgment in not including extended portions of that exchange. I don't know how we're going to reach people now. I know that there's a lot more availability of press now that I've announced that I'm going to be able to talk to people that I haven't been able to talk to for 18 years, that I've been censored in talking to. If we can't have a common consensus about what is true and what is not true, we're going to be at each other's throats. And then the government's remedy for that is silencing people who disagree with the official story and marginalizing them and vilifying them and gaslighting them and, uh, you know, making them pariahs. How can the Kennedy campaign campaign today in the face of all this hostility? So far, the internet has been our friend to some extent because it is in our hands and it's possible for us to live stream. It's possible for us to get our own message out. Even though every other website out there seems to be hostile and intent either on censoring that message or directly attacking their agenda until they turn the internet off. Those are the means that can be used to keep this campaign going, you know? And if they turn the internet off, then we're gonna have to rely on face-to-face -face communication. I look at this crowd, I see all the flags of Europe. I see people of every color. We living in a sea of propaganda and censorship. And when I look at the media, it's all these narratives, they all want you to get to think and act in a certain way. And so 
And most people are not, they don't have a good defense against propaganda. Between Facebook and the White House, there was an acknowledgement that they were being asked and they were complying with censoring information that everybody knew to be true. Tapped up the cost of the Ukraine war to $113 billion. I am not going to run a mean-spirited campaign or a personal campaign against President Biden. And I think everybody wants to say vaccines. Look, when the horse track is muddy, all horses have a chance to win. Well, look at where politics in our nation and our world is today. It's a muddy horse track. Bobby has a great chance of doing this. We have a poll. Kennedy Jr has basically been nowhere, yet he's at 20%. And with an absolutely hostile media team. A new poll from Echelon Insights finds that Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s favorability numbers among likely voters are the same as Vice President Kamala Harris's and Donald Trump's at 39% and just a few points below President Biden, who has 43%. But the more notable statistic here is that RFK Jr.'s favorability is skyrocketing. I think Americans, a lot of Americans, are really interested in somebody who will tell them the truth. And if I'm right about that, then, you know, this election will have a happy ending for me. And if it's not, I'll still have a happy ending. So. <laughs>
Yope, Wapa, Aumishika Manukama Na, Ke ko chemane moa sta peine to, e ne mihikan e ne ta maone mano e seke maka. Wai wainen ke tane ni moa, ne tano e makanuk e ne. Have a beautiful day, everybody. Nice to see you. We are going to keep this right on going. We have an awesome, awesome performer coming up. She's going to sing for us. She's noted to be from the Hill House. And I don't know if you guys know about the Hill House, but the Hill House was recognized by Ronald Reagan for the work that Ms. Hale did in the community. So everyone, without further ado, I'm going to introduce this wonderful, wonderful performer, Mika Hale. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Chief of Staff for the Kennedy Campaign, Ms. Bridget Rasmussen.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I just wanted to come up and say a few words about the We the People party here in California. Who's heard of We the People? Woo! Awesome. Amazing. So as an independent candidate, Bobby does not automatically appear on the ballot here in California. So we formed a party called We the People in order to uh, get him ballot access here in California, which also happens to be my home state. I'm actually from San Francisco, so just across the bridge. Um, so we've got dozens of volunteers here. They all have green badges and they can all walk you through the steps in just a couple minutes to register for We the People. Um, and that's how we're gonna get Bobby on the ballot in California and eventually get him in the White House. So, yep. Thank you so much again for being here and being a part of this historical day. How's everybody doing? There's a lot of energy in this building. Make some noise for RFK. Let's get it, keep the energy going. Well, we're going to do something collaborative to make sure we continue to show our support. So I want everybody to pull out their phones right now or in three seconds. <laughs> and I want you to text FUTURE to 20241. Remember, text FUTURE to 20241. And is everybody ready to, de to declare their independence? Is everybody ready to declare their independence? Everybody watching in this audience, once again, text FUTURE to 20241. And we're going to see you soon. We declare our independence. This is a day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. We stand here in the name of freedom. We are committed to peaceful and nonviolent change. We must recognize the full human equality of all of our people, not just to those of a particular religion, not just to those of a particular race, not just to the wealthy, but to all of the people. We must do it for the single and fundamental reason that it is the right thing to do. A new twist this morning for the country's most famous political dynasty. RFK Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. 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 That it's time to heal a divided nation and return the power to the people. Robert Kennedy Jr. We are told today that our nation is hopelessly divided. But I found something different as I travel this country. I have witnessed an upwelling of optimism that I've never seen before. Something is stirring in us that says it doesn't have to be this way. And so I've come here today to declare our independence from the tyranny of corruption, which robs us of affordable lives, our belief in the future, and our respect for each other. But to do that, I must first declare my own independence. Independence from the Democratic Party. And from all other political parties. I haven't made this decision lightly. It's very painful for me to let go of the party of my uncles, my father, my grandfather, and both of my great-grandfathers but my sacrifice is nothing compared to the risk our founding fathers took when they signed the Declaration of Independence 247 years ago. They knew that if their revolution failed, every last one of them would be hanged. They chose to place everything on the line. When John Adams put his pen down 
after adding his signature to the declaration, he turned to those present and he said to them, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, from this day on, I am with my country. I'm gonna make that same pledge to you today so that I can stand before you as every leader should stand before you, free of partisan allegiance, free from the backroom deals, a servant only to my conscience, to my creator, and to you. Every president enters office promising to unite the nation and to work with people from the other party across the aisle. None of them ever does it. They can't. They're already chosen a side. Well, I'm not going to have that problem. I'm going to build coalitions from both sides of the aisle. And except for the small minority of public officials who are actually corrupt, I'm going to tell you this secret. They, too, want liberation from the system that has captured them. And isn't that ultimately what we all want? Liberation from a system that robs us of our wealth, our health, our hope, our patriotism, our ideals, our freedoms, and ultimately our sense of ourselves as a good and capable people. Is healing our divided nation possible? Let's go take back our country. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. I declare my independence. Yo declaro mi independencia. We declare our independence. I declare my independence. Few men are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. It is the one essential, vital quality for those who seek to change the world. I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I approve this message. Ladies and gentlemen, the brilliant, the beautiful, the hilarious, Cheryl Hines. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Oh my gosh, I am so excited that you're here to help us celebrate another milestone on Bobby's campaign to the presidency. Yes. And I just want to take a moment to say, as we move through our day, let's think about the people in Baltimore um, who are experiencing their tragedy and we want to keep them in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our prayers today. Um, yeah. So you're probably here to hear what Bobby has to say today. <laughs> it's a very exciting day and you will not be disappointed. Uh, one of the things that I love about Bobby, there are a lot, I won't spend the day naming them, but but one of the things that I, I truly respect about him, I have watched him and continue to watch him inspire people of all different parties to come together for the greater good of this country. Yeah. So when you look around you, you're probably gonna see Republicans, Democrats, Independents, all gathered together 
to see what we have in common and how we can work together. And that's what Bobby's all about, and that's who he is, and that's what he's doing. And America is listening and is inspired. All right, I think we should just do it. Are you ready to hear from Bobby? <laughs> Are you at all interested to hear from the new VP pick? Okay, okay, well, let's, let's make a lot of noise. I want to really hear how enthusiastic you are about this. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for my love, uh, for the next president of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I want to start out, first of all, for thanking all of you, and thanking Oakland, and thank all of you for being here today. I also want to thank the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the tribal chiefdoms, uh, the Muikli Ohlone tribe, and the chairwoman of the tribal council for endorsing me today for putting their faith in me. And they know the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Oh, and they know very much they, uh, that, the, that this struggle for indigenous rights has consumed a lot of my life, my personal and my professional life, and that this work is going to continue when we are in the White House. The Muwekmalones are one of the many tribes that were, that were decertified during the 1950s and 1960s, and these tribes need to be re-legitimized, and that's something that I will do as soon as I get in the White House. I, I want to say something about Oakland. My father spent a lot of time doing hearings in Oakland on the poverty issues for the Poverty Committee in 1967 when he was a United States Senator. And then he came back here in 1968 on the presidential campaign. And during that presidential run, he made an unscheduled visit to Oakland's Taylor Memorial Church. And he went there with Willie Brown, who, as you know, later became mayor of uh, San Francisco, but at that time he was an assemblyman. And he came to meet with a lot of local activists here in Oakland at a very, very violent and turbulent time. He met with the NAACP and the Black Panther Party. And it was a very rancorous meeting. He was advised by the local police chief not to go. Uh, he attended with two of his companions, John Glenn, the astronaut, one of his best friends, Rafer Johnson, who had been the decathlon champion in 1960 and was one of my father's closest friends. And the meeting was so rancorous and vitriolic at, at, that at one point, Rafer and John Glenn advised my father to leave. People were insulting him. People were threatening him. And my dad refused, and he said, this is between me and them. I need to hear them out. I need to hear what they're going to say. The next, and he waited. He, he stayed throughout that meeting. And the next day, all of the people who were at that meeting 
signed up to join his campaign. And the Black Panther Party provided his security detail here in Oakland and continued, continued to provide security for him later on in the campaign during, in his convoys. And there was a lesson that I just wanted to share with you because it's a lesson all of us need to learn at this point in our history. And we need to start listening to each other, even when it's difficult. We, we need to sit through the anger. We need to sit with each other and listen to the feelings and not walk away and not see each other as enemies. But learn to love each other even through that anger and vitriol. We need to start coming back to each other as Americans again. Now, The last time I was in Oakland was when I served on the trial team in the Monsanto cases. And we, so we tried two of the three cases in this city. We won, uh, we won an ad, we won a 289 million in the first, and then the third one, which we tried here, we won. We asked the jury for a billion dollars, and an Oakland jury gave us 2.2 billion dollars. And that, that brought Monsanto to the, to the negotiating table, and we, we settled then all 40,000 cases. But I lived here for several months during that trial, and I got to really love the city. The Monsanto case was the latest in a lifetime of battles for me to get poisons out of our food and out of our farms and to restore our soils. The effort, that effort, has consumed a lot of my life. And I wanted a vice president who shared my passion for wholesome, healthy foods, chemical-free, for regenerative agriculture, for good soils, I found exactly the right person. And among other things, she has used over the past several years cutting edge technology, including AI, to calculate the catastrophic health consequences of toxins in our soil, our air, our water, and our food. Technology has been a lifelong passion for my future vice president. This is important because I also wanted a vice president who shares my indignation about the participation of big tech as a partner in the censorship and the surveillance and the information warfare that our government is currently waging against the American people. And that's why I'm bringing on someone with a deep inside knowledge of how, about how big tech uses AI to manipulate the public. I want to partner with strong ideas about how to reverse those dire threats to democracy and to our freedoms. I managed to find a technologist at the forefront of AI. She has spent the last decade relying on neural networks, artificial intelligence, and cutting edge science to identify abuses in our government. She understands that the health of every American is a national security issue and a national security risk. Her work has proven time and again that health drives our economy, that it is the foundation of our mental health, our national happiness, our ability to lead the world in innovation and in prosperity and in peace. I also wanted someone who was an athlete who could help me inspire Americans to heal, to get them back in shape. And I'm happy to report that my vice president is an avid surfer. <laughs> uh, 
who, attend, who attended school on a softball scholarship. I wanted, right here in Oakland, I wanted someone who was battle-tested, able to withstand criticism and the controversy and all the defamations and slanders and perjuries that are thrown against anyone who embarks on a presidential campaign. I wanted an advocate who has seen corruption of our regulatory agencies firsthand, who shares my indignation about the way it allows regulated industries to commoditize our food, our wildlife, and our children. I wanted someone who would honor the traditions of our nation as a nation of immigrants, but who also understands that to be a nation, we need secure borders. I, I wanted a partner who was a gifted administrator, but also possesses the gift of curiosity, an open, inquiring mind, and the confidence to change even her strongest opinions in the face of contrary evidence. I wanted someone with a spiritual dimension and compassion and idealism, and above all, a deep love for the United States of America. And I found all of those qualities in a woman who grew up right here in Oakland, the daughter of immigrants, who overcame every daunting obstacle and went on to achieve the highest levels of the American dream. So that is why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. tell you a little bit about Nicole before we bring her out here, and then we're going to see a video. And Nicole's personal story began in Oakland. She was the daughter of impoverished immigrants. She grew up on food stamps and welfare in this city, beset by many, many other unique challenges, all of which she overcame. Her very, very American journey took her to a career as a patent attorney and as a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur and as a Stanford University fellow. Like many of us, Nicole assumed our government was working for our people, that our defense and intelligence agencies wanted peace, that public health agencies wanted us to be healthy, that the USDA supported wholesome foods and family farms, that the EPA would stand up for clean air and clean water, that the Fed wanted prosperous America, that the Democratic Party was on the side of the middle class, the working poor, and Main Street small businesses, that scientists were incorruptible, and that the, that the science was a search for, for, an exalted search for the truth, and that the President of the United States could always be counted on to defend free speech. I, too, used to believe those things. Do you remember those days? <laughs> and she'll tell you that she now understands that the defense agencies work for the military-industrial complex, that health agencies work for big pharma, that the USDA works for big ag and the processed food cartels, that the EPA is in cahoots with the polluters, that scientists can be mercenaries, that government officials sometimes act as censors, and that the Fed works for Wall Street and allows millionaire bankers to prey upon, upon Main Street and the American worker. And that's why Nicole and I both left the Democratic Party.
Our values didn't change, but the Democratic Party did. The things that we love are still the same. We love our families, our children, and our faith. We love clean air and clean water and productive soils and good food. We love the wilderness and our Purple Mountains majesty. And above all, we love our country. We, we want America to live up to her highest ideals. We want her to be an exemplary nation again, a global leader in freedom, opportunity, and responsible government. We want America to be a peacemaker, a moral authority. We want our children to grow up as I did, in a country for which they feel love and pride. We want them to feel safe and to have every opportunity for dignity, prosperity, and community. We want them to have confidence in their futures. We want them to have the best education. We want America to be friendly to farmers and entrepreneurs. We want America to honor its veterans and its teachers. We want scientists to stand up for science and for truth. And we want our government to defend our right to free speech. <laughs> Nicole and I share all of these values. And you know what? Despite the artificially orchestrated divisions, nearly all Americans share the same values that we do. And I'm grateful that Nicole has put her self-interest aside and made the momentous and very, very difficult decision to embark with me on this extraordinary crusade to win back our country. And I was most importantly looking for a partner who is a young person. And Nicole is only 38 years old. And I wanted that because I want Nicole to be a champion to the growing number of millennials and Gen Z Americans who have lost faith in their future and lost their pride in our country. Many in her generation have stopped believing that older people who have been running our government for so long understand them or represent their interests. That older generation that now dominates Congress, the Supreme Court, and the White House is the same generation, the same people, who ran up the $34 trillion debt, and millennials and Gen Z and their children will shoulder the burden it was my baby boom generation that unleashed the epidemic of chronic disease that has many America, had made America the sickest country in the world. The only response this calamity, to this calamity by government officials today is to gaslight us into pretending that it's all normal, that it's not really happening. Nicole and I both share doubts about the corporate captured uniparty and that it can produce leaders capable of imagining a different version of America, a hopeful version of the future. We both have doubts that either the Democratic or Republican Party nominees are capable of dealing with the complexities and fulfilling the great promise of a technology-driven economy. In the right hands, technology can be America's salvation. It can give us the path out of debt chaos, out of environmental ruin, out of the chronic disease epidemic, but we both fear that in the wrong hands, technology can turn its power against humanity. We don't think that either President Trump or President Biden understands the promise or the peril of technology sufficiently to direct its trajectory toward freedom and healing and prosperity. And we're now witnessing this dismaying contest between the two oldest presidential candidates in history. Those two men 
during their terms as president, both worked to close our Main Street businesses for a year, 3.3 million businesses, with no due process, no scientific citation, no public hearings, no environmental impact statement. They just told us to shut them down. Those policies that both of them engineered transferred $4 trillion from the middle class to this new oligarchy of billionaires. They created 500 new billionaires in 500 days, a billionaire a day. Today, they, together, they ran up a greater debt than all previous presidents combined since George Washington. Two men with a single term in office each. Now, they don't want us talking about those things. They want us instead to hate each other, to fear the other guy. But to young Americans, they look like two sides of the same coin. If we vote for either of them again, we can expect and we will deserve more of the same. The annihilation of our middle class, the further impoverishment of working poor, more chronic disease, more epidemics, more environmental destruction, more debt, more war, and fewer constitutional rights. I've asked Nicole to use the platform of the vice presidency to speak for all, not just young people, but all the invisible, voiceless Americans who feel let down by our government. As your vice president, Nicole will represent working poor who feel forgotten, who sink every day deeper into debt. She's gonna fight for all those Americans who know what it's like to skip meals to pay for gasoline and who watch food prices spike ever higher and wonder how in the world they're gonna make it through the grocery store checkout line. I want her to stand up for the children who are receiving substandard educations and for the veterans who are feeding their families in soup kitchens and for the 1.1 million American children whose parents served in Afghanistan and Iraq and who silently struggle with PTSD and with traumatic brain injury. I want, I want her to represent the mothers who struggle to protect their children from bad chemicals, bad pharmaceuticals, and bad food. As vice president, she will stand between them and the big ag, big pharma, the chemical industry, the processed food industry, the government regulators who are colluding to poison our kids for profit. And as vice president, she's gonna stand with me against the military industrial complex. and the neocon interventionists and all of their forever wars. In 1932, Franklin Roosevelt appointed my grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, to run his brand new Securities and Exchange Commission. My grandfather had been a stock manipulator on Wall Street, and FDR wanted a, a chairman who understood the stock market inside and out as the only person who could reform it. In a similar vein, Nicole will stand up to Silicon Valley, which she knows inside and out. And she's gonna stand up to Wall Street, to the big banks, the larcenous K Street lobbyists, the regulatory czars, the unbridled central bank money printers, the crony capitalists, and all of the other people who have turned our country from a democracy into a corporate kleptocracy. These are the people.
their cupidity drives our corrupt campaign finance system, which is mo nothing more than a system of legalized bribery. This is a system that has put agency capture on steroids and made our government regulators sock puppets for the industries that they're supposed to regulate. The corrupt merger of state and corporate power now straddles our nation's capital like a mythical harpy, sucking the economic, social, and moral vitality out of the nation's polity of free citizens, gorging itself on the bleaching bones of the American middle class. Nicole is going to help me free our country from that predatory cabal. Our independent run for the presidency is finally going to bring down the Democratic and Republican duopoly. That, that gave us this ruinous debt, chronic disease, endless wars, lockdowns, mandates, agency capture, and the same Trump-Biden uniparty that has captured and appropriated democracy and turned it over to BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, and the other corporate donors. Nicole Shanahan will help me rally support for our revolution against the uniparty rule from both ends of the right and left political spectrum. Now let me tell you what Nicole and I are up against and what we need to do to win and how we're going to do it. The New York Times this week published an article estimating that the Democratic Party war chest will ultimately be, which is 1.1 billion today already, the largest in the history of any political party. Within a few months, it's going to be $3 billion. And the Democratic Party is not going to use that war chest to amplify President Biden's voice is using it to stop its opponents from getting on the ballot and to turn Americans against each other and, in, in, and inundate us with fear. Incidentally, the Republican Party will raise about the same amount. Does anybody here think that these big money donors who are giving all that money are acting out of a patriotic impulse? Do you think they're acting out of a humanitarian impulse? No, of course they're not. For them, this is an investment, and they expect a return on that investment, and they expect a very, very big return. The campaign finance system has transformed our government from a model democracy into a, into a corporate kleptocracy. So we're up against power powerful, this campaign is up against the most powerful financial interest in history. We also face a determined campaign to keep us off the ballot by fair means or foul. Evidently, the Democrats have little faith in their candidates' ability to win in the old-fashioned way at the voting booth. We are going to overcome these financial and legal challenges. But I want to talk about another obstacle that's even more important. It's the obstacle of cynicism. It's the obstacle of fear. It's the deeply ingrained habit of voting for someone you have little passion for because he is the lesser of two evils. Because you are so afraid that the other guy will win. Well, don't you want to vote for someone this time? Not just, not just against someone. Don't you want to vote for a candidate and a country that you can be proud of? I know you do, because 70% of Americans say that they don't want to have to choose between President Trump and President Biden. They don't want to choose between the lesser of two evils again. 
I especially don't want to choose between the two men who brought us the $34 trillion debt, the endless wars, the censorship, the corrupt merger of state and corporate power. Republicans and Democrats have taken turns in office for 30 years now, and all of these problems have just gotten worse. That's why those same polls show that my approval ratings are far above those of President Trump and President Biden. Now, both the Democrats and Republicans are looking at those poll results, and they're devising ways to keep me off the ballot. They don't want to give you the choice. You know, when I was a, a kid, the Democratic Party was fighting. Its primary fight was to make sure that every American had the right to vote, and none of us were disenfranchised. But today's Democratic Party is doing the opposite. It's working to disenfranchise any Americans who, who, don't, who they don't think will vote, again, vote for their agenda. The principal technique is to call me a spoiler and instill fear in Americans that voting for me will, will get some other terrifying candidate elected. Our campaign is a spoiler. I agree with that. It, It's a, it's a spoiler for President Biden and for President Trump. It's a spoiler for the war machine. It's a spoiler for Wall Street and big ag and big tech and big telecom and big pharma and the corporate-owned media, and all the polit corrupt politicians and corporations. That's why they're trying to keep me off the ballot and to frighten you into choosing between the two tired and unpopular heads of the Uniparty. Millions, millions of Americans are not going to vote at all if they're not given another choice. They're simply withdrawing from American democracy. Well, Nicole and I are going to give those millions another choice. The Democrats and Republicans are trying to divide America. They tell us to hate each other, to mistrust each other, to accuse each other of treason to warn us against these, in apocalyptical terms, that democracy itself is doomed if the other side wins. They turn families against each other. They turn neighbors against each other and friends against each other. They're trying to divide America. But Nicole and I will unite it. And that's our path to victory. And that's. That's how we're going to win. That's how we're going to forge an unstoppable coalition of homeless Democrats and homeless Republicans who are ready to, to look at the universal values that unite us all and, 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 that, and that every conscientious American wants the same way Nicole wants it and I want it. All of those things that I described our love, our children, good food, good soils, moral authority around the world, the end of the warfare state, an incorruptible government, all of those things we all want. If we can only persuade enough Americans to vote out of hope rather than of fear, we're going to be in the White House in September, November. We've all had the advantage of seeing what President Trump and President Biden can do for our country. Do any of you want more of the same? If you want more of the same, you should vote out of fear. If you want genuine change and you need to take a risk and join Team Kennedy,
join the new American revolution. What that means is to vote from your conscience, vote from your heart, vote out of idealism, vote out of optimism for this country. Refuse above all to vote from fear. You know, in 1776, there was a generation of Americans who believed in democracy and something that didn't exist anywhere in the world. Something that was so improbable, so implausible, so impossible. And most people thought it was a joke. And yet they, read, they took a risk, not a little risk, not the little risk that you're taking today by going through a voting booth. They risked their lives and many of them lost it. They, they risked their properties. They risked their reputations. And they gave us the democracy that we have today, the model democracy for the whole world. So they acted out of fear. And if you vote out of fear on this election, you are dishonoring that generation of Americans and the, and the other, and the thousands and hundreds of thousands of Americans who gave their lives in the Civil War, in World War II, in World War I, and all of the other times that people went and risked their lives to defend our country. If Nicole and I can get Americans to refuse to vote from fear, we're going to be in the White House in November. <laughs> Nicole and I are running to help heal the symptoms of an ailing America, to heal our divisions, to heal our economy, to heal our mental health and our spiritual and our physical health. But we can't do it alone. We need you. And now I have a governing partner who will fight for you and for your family until the last corporate kickback from our government, the last toxin is cleared from our water and our soil. until the last American child gets to live a healthy life and to pursue their own happiness in the land of the free, until the last censor is gone from our government. I'm, I'm confident that there is no American more qualified than Nicole Shanahan to play this role. So I'm proud to introduce to all of you the next president. Vice President of the United States of America, Nicole Shanahan. Thank you all very much. She's a visionary leader and relentless in driving and supporting important projects to improve our lives. Great perseverance, great leadership. Her success is unparalleled. She is an incredibly inspiring woman who touches the hearts and minds of everyone I have seen her bring together. Okay. Can you talk to me well? Oh, great. Okay, cross. Okay, cross. What young people are faced with today is completely unprecedented. And it's going to take a new generation of leadership that understands deeply those threats because they are themselves technologists to address the issues at hand. It's going to take leadership that has spent their life in technology. It's going to take leadership that understands what questions to ask, how to ask them, and what it looks like to implement a plan. This is not the America of the 1950s. This is the America of 2024. And in this America, it's going to take communities coming to the White House that never have actually been in the White House. And these are going to be tech communities, these are going to be Gen Z communities, these are going to be millennial communities who really believe that working together is going to get us to a healthier America with solutions that actually work. I 
was born in Roseville, California, near Sacramento. Then my mom and dad decided to move back to Oakland into the home my dad grew up in. You learn from a young age growing up in Oakland that we are all made equal and we all get a shot at something great. And the color of your skin just gives you a different, cool cultural perspective. And, you know, I'm half Chinese, half Caucasian, but to the people around me, I was Nicole. My mom immigrated to the United States in 1983 from Guangzhou, China. My father, in particular, struggled with substance abuse, various mental health challenges. We relied on government assistance for a good portion of my childhood. Every time my dad lost a job, there wasn't a lot of money to cover basic expenses like food. And we would get food stamps and go to the local grocery store with our mom, my brother and I. And at the checkout counter, I remember, she, she would ask my brother and I to go stand by the magazines when it was time to pay. <laughs> It was hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Those programs, um, they saved my family. They gave me a chance. I went to the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. I graduated in 2007 and I started working actually on medical device patents as a paralegal. I was always asked to be kind of the resident law firm nerd that was in charge of making sure the software always worked well and represented all the client data correctly. And I loved it. I was at Santa Clara Law School, which is really in the heart of Silicon Valley and trains some of the top IP law professionals in the country. In 2014, I, I joined Stanford Law and Computer Science to become a Codex Fellow. My center at Stanford, Codex, one of our core themes is how to build humanistic programming into AI. AI unregulated can be a disastrous for us. We're already seeing early signs of it. And, you know, on day one, of Bobby Kennedy's presidency as his vice president, I will mobilize the best legal ethicists in AI on the planet. And they're going to have knowledge of computational ethics. So after my two years at Stanford, I spun out my company, Clear Access IP. I then founded a foundation of my own called Bia Echo Foundation, one of the largest funds in women's reproductive health ever created. Human reproductive health is in decline globally and at a pace that is actually causing alarm in certain countries right now. Women's health is a direct indication of environmental health. I gave birth to a healthy baby girl in November of 2018. That was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> From time of birth until seven months, she smiled, she giggled, she paid attention, she hugged, she, you know, grasped th for things. She had a great appetite. At around 10 months, things had, had changed dramatically. She wasn't engaging as much, and her energy didn't seem as high, and her muscle mass seemed weak. I would, you know, sit her to just sit on her own and she wouldn't be able to hold herself up when previously she could. She wasn't speaking, she wasn't pointing, she seemed kind of, you know, in her own world and the evaluator clearly identified symptoms associated with autism spectrum disorder. And it was then and there in 2020 that my life changed forever. Chronic disease in children is due to environmental disruptors that cause inflammatory symptoms, which then reduce the child's ability to heal. I've learned that the top environmental health exposures are really in three categories. There's endocrine disruption, which is caused by various chemicals, chemicals in our consumer products, chemicals and preservatives in our foods. The second category of environmental exposures are electrochemical in nature. That electrical interference comes in the form of our wireless technologies, our devices, our cell phones, and we have no regulatory body currently in the United States keeping an eye on this. The third category of environmental exposures 
really is medications that we rely on for our healthcare system. And ironically, many of these medications are prescribed to help manage the symptoms related to exposures caused by categories one and two. It's a Band-Aid that actually poses new risks. I've spent my life in data and technology, and I know that there is a solution here to this problem. We have the tools today to get there, and if we are open to this conversation, we are on path to healing America. And that is a simple conclusion that I think any person in America can make once they have the information. We owe it to the American family to take these toxins out of our food and out of our water, out of our medicines. This campaign is so much more than politics. This campaign is about what is sacred. And what is sacred is our health and our families in this land, this beautiful land that deserves much greater attention and care than we've given it. I'm making this move as an independent now because I've been finding it harder and harder to find the leadership in the White House that represents the issues closest to my heart. And in order for us to get there, I think we all need to rethink what has happened to the DNC and the RNC for that matter. We need an opportunity. We crave an opportunity to see how we can serve in the best interests of the American public outside of a system that hasn't worked. We deserve a real election of optimism. And that's what Bobby Kennedy gives us a chance at. Ladies and gentlemen, the next Vice President of the United States, Nicole Shanahan. for being here today. It is so good to be here in Oakland. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this city will always have a special place in my heart. You know, I, I grew up just a few miles from this very spot. My mother, who's standing right there with her phone up, <laughs> she immigrated here from Guangzhou, China. And my late father, was an Irish and German-American. I want to tell you a little bit about my childhood so you can understand the source of my politics and convictions. My mother's first job when she came to the United States in 1983 was as a live-in caretaker to an elderly woman here at Lake Merritt. By the time I was born, she worked as a dental office secretary my father loved my brother and I dearly, but he was very troubled, plagued by substance abuse, and he struggled to keep a job. From watching my father and his struggles, I learned not to be judgmental. He was doing the best he could. 
I think of him when I see the statistics of the millions of Americans who are addicted, depressed, or suffering. This is one of the epidemics of our time. It affects nearly every American family. I wish my experience was unusual, but it's not. It has become part of my determination to do something for our country. Every time my dad lost his job, our family just couldn't cover expenses. Food, gas, clothing, upkeep. It adds up more than you have in this situation. I know a lot of Americans know exactly what that's like, to just be one misfortune away from disaster. I think, I don't think we would have made it without food stamps and government help. My mom worked hard, but it wouldn't have been possible to keep it together without that help. As you probably know, I became very wealthy later on in life, but my roots in Oakland taught me many things I have never forgotten. That the purpose of wealth is to help those in need. That's what it's for. And I want to bring, back, I want to bring that back to politics too. That is the purpose of privilege. I went to St. Mary's High School, just a few miles from here. In my junior year, <laughs> we have some St. Mary's Panthers here. Um, woo. In my junior year, I had another formative experience. Um, and that set me up for this lifetime of political consciousness. I applied for a program to live with families in El Salvador. In praying with these families and helping them rebuild after the Civil War there, I learned what war really is. I learned how it rips lives apart, it brutalizes children, how it visits unspeakable horror on the innocent. And I also learned the resilience of the human spirit and its infinite capacity to heal, to forgive and to restore. El Salvador is where I came to understand war, but more importantly is where I also came to understand peace. That is what inspired me to my first political action in high school. At the onset of the Iraq War, I became an anti-war activist. Yes. If I'm being honest, I didn't really know how to do it. Um, I printed pamphlets and I led a walkout and we went to our local radio station. Um, but I knew in my bones then that violence begets more violence. I'd seen what that does to society and I didn't want my country, the country I love so dearly, to be doing that in the world. Yeah. So these are two of my political convictions I hold today to serve peace, and to help those in poverty. <laughs> so you can understand why I gravitated to the Democratic Party, because that was supposed to be the party of peace, the party of compassion. Many Democrats, we still believe in those ideals, but unfortunately as an institution, it has lost its way. <laughs> there is only one anti-war candidate today, and you won't find him in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. He is an independent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> Yes, and it, it, it is his commitment to peace and to the welfare of hardworking people in America that draw me as a person of compassion to his candidacy. Yes. As recently as a year ago, I really didn't think much of Bobby Kennedy because I didn't know much about him. All I had was a mainstream media narrative that was effectively telling me 
horrible, disparaging things. <laughs> but then a friend who's here today pulled me aside and she said, Nicole, please do me a favor. Just listen to an interview with Bobby Kennedy, just one. So I did. I did. And then I, I, I listened to another one and then another one. And I recognized that the person who I was seeing in these interviews was the exact opposite of the media slander of his character. I saw a person of intelligence, of compassion, and of reason. I saw a fellow lawyer who had committed himself to finding the truth and fighting for the environment and for people. I discovered a person who speaks out on issues that even though they are critically important to human health and welfare, are consistently ignored by our government. And for the first time in a long time, I felt hope for our democracy again. We can do this. <laughs> it's possible. One of those issues also happens to be a passion of mine and a fo focus of my philanthropic work, chronic disease. I got into it through my own journey of reproductive health, followed by a steep learning curve for caring for my daughter who has an autism diagnosis. In that journey, I discovered that women's fertility is in precipitous decline around the world. We are facing a crisis in reproductive health that is embedded in the larger epidemic of chronic disease. Because it has been so personal for me and my daughter, I got deep into the research and consulted some of the best scientists and doctors. Let me tell you what I found. There are three main causes. One is the toxic substances in our environment, like endocrine disrupting chemicals in our food, water, and soil, like the pesticide residues, the industrial pollutants, the microplastics, the PFAs, the food additives, and the forever chemicals that have contaminated ne nearly every human cell. Yes, and it makes you angry to hear this. It makes me angry to say it because we shouldn't be here right now. Second is electromagnetic pollution. You don't hear politicians talking much about that either, but it is something we need to look at. As Bobby says, <laughs> we need to investigate every possible cause of chronic disease epidemic that is devouring our nation from the inside. Third, I'm sorry to say, is our medications. Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical medicine has its place, but no single safety study can assess the cumulative impact of one prescription on top of another prescription and one shot on top of another shot on top of another shot throughout the course of childhood. We just don't do that study right now, and we ought to. We can and we will. Conditions like autism used to be one in 10,000. Now here in the state of California, it is one in 22. One in 22 children affected. Allergies, obesity, anxiety, depression, our children are not well. Our people are not well. And our country will not be well for very much longer if we don't heed this desperate call for attention. I've spoken to our government agencies, trust me, I've tried. I've spoken to senators, I've spoken to governors. They all know something is wrong, but none of them take any action. There is only one candidate I have met for president who takes the chronic disease epidemic seriously. It is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and I will be his ally in making our nation healthy again. Yes. It is not about a new pill or, quote, finding the cure. We know the cure is cleaning up our environment and providing the basic public goods that are the foundational conditions for health and healing.
It is about a shift in our priorities. It is about compassion. Chronic disease, addiction, poverty, depression, this is where Americans are hurting the most. It is time for politicians to listen. So here is how the Kennedy-Shanahan ticket is going to end the chronic disease epidemic. While Bobby is focused on ending the corporate capture of our regulatory agencies, I am going to assemble the best technologists and scientists in the world, and we will use the latest in AI and computation and examine the health records databases of our nation and those other nations who are also on a quest to solve chronic disease. We will find the answers. We will find the answers to our most pressing health concerns within weeks, not decades. We can if we have access to those databases. It is time to move out of the dark ages of medicine. We can solve the mysteries guarded by corporate influence. We can move from Band-Aid solutions, and we can end this chronic disease epidemic once and for all. I believe it. <laughs> you know, my sense is that most American moms and dads already know the truth of the matter, and it's just long overdue that the duty of care owed to the American family is actually given. We can find the answers conclusively. You know, I have a background in tech, um, so I tend to think in terms of data. In my tech days, I developed AI-powered software to automate affordable legal services? Well, guess what? The CDC and research institutions have the data we need. We can apply technology to figure out environmental factors. We can figure out what's making us sick. We just have to ask the right questions, do the right eat research, and apply the right tools. We have to rid science of the corporate bias that contaminates it today. Then we put this thing into reverse. So actually, the first issue that I applied my tech background to was criminal justice. It was across the bay in San Francisco where the district attorney's office needed help examining thousands of police records thought to contain evidence of racial bias, wrongful arrest, and patterns of prejudice. I put together a team of computer scientists to develop a computational method to collate these records and design a method for analysis. But what I really learned through this was the sorry state of criminal justice in our country. It isn't just about policing, it is about the school to prison pipeline, it is about a broken and dismally functioned infrastructure, it is about recidivism that we have not taken the right approach to. How do we make our systems a system of rehabilitation and not punishment? These questions don't have easy answers. I know this is hard. This is very hard, but they are the right questions to be asked, and there's only one candidate asking them, and it's Bobby Kennedy. And I'm going to mention one more issue close to my heart. This has to do with climate. My interest in health and solving climate issues has led me to the realm of agriculture. I realize that a nation's health comes down to its soil and the people who work it. Hell yeah. Healthy soil is the foundation of healthy food. It is the foundation of a healthy ecosystem. And it is our answer to the climate crisis. It is the foundation of healthy economy. But what politician besides Bobby Kennedy do you ever hear talking about soil? 
None. <laughs> I've produced two films on the issue. Common Ground is the latest. I've, <laughs> we've, we've got some Common Ground and Kiss the Ground people here. Thank you guys for coming out today. I've talked to Congress people and senators, but all I've gotten are vague promises that never amount to real change. Republicans and Democrats alike have fallen under the sway of big agrochemical agro companies and food conglomerates. They might invoke the ideal of the family farm, but they have betrayed it again and again. So I am entering myself. I know I, I, I'm not a politician until just now, but I am entering myself to do this work and to highlight this need because guess what? I've met some of the most innovative American farmers. Their methods rebuild soil, sequester carbon, recharge aquifers, and revitalize the economy. <laughs> and you know what? We don't have to force anyone to do anything or to imitate them. All we have to do is change our system of regulation and subsidy to support those methods. <laughs> We can no longer support extractive corporate agriculture. I hope, I am so hopeful for this. I hope you all understand now what has brought me into politics, hasn't it? And, it, and what, in this moment, I, I am leaving the Democratic Party. And I want to say two things about that. First, even though I am leaving the party, I believe I am taking the best ideals and impulses with me. The, Demo the Democratic Party is supposed to be the party of compassion. It is supposed to be the party of diplomacy and science. It is supposed to be the party of civil liberties and free speech. And most importantly, the party of the middle class and the American dream. While I know many Democrats still abide by those values, I want to point out, and I've been in touch with many people in the Democratic Party, I do believe they've lost their way in their leadership. I worry for the party's overwhelming interest in elitism, celebrity, and winning at all costs. And I worry that they do it even if that means turning a blind eye on the issues that they all know to be true. I know this because I've been in those circles for the last eight years and I have grown increasingly tired of it. It wasn't until I met Bobby and the people supporting him that I felt any hope in the outcome of this election. As I've re-examined my Democratic Party assumptions, I have seen conservative voters with new eyes too. I have met farmers, I have met hunters who are some of the most staunch conservationists I have ever met, who understand ecosystems better than most. <laughs> I have met mothers protecting their children who are searching every possible avenue for their health. And yet the Republican Party, like the Democratic, is letting them down because the actions of the party are diverting from the values that actually support individual freedom. In fact, the very failure of both parties to do their job to protect their founding values has contributed to the decline of this country in my lifetime. Maybe that's why I see so many Republicans disillusioned with their party as I become disillusioned with mine. If you are one of those disillusioned Republicans, I welcome you to join me, a disillusioned Democrat, in this movement to unify and heal America.
This independent movement comes at a time of extreme division in America that threatens to tear this country apart. Yes, let's fix it. It is time for a realignment. It is time, as Bobby Kennedy says, to focus on our unifying values rather than our divisions. And so if anyone is listening who never considered an independent ticket, I want to extend the same invitation to you that my friend did to me last year. Please listen to Bobby Kennedy in his own words. Take a look at his vision for America. It is a vision that I share too, as I spend the next seven months of my life getting him on each and every ballot in this country. <laughs> We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. The vision we share is a vision of national healing. It is an America that leads the world no longer through force of arms, but through the power of example. It is an America that wages peace through diplomacy. It is an America that had, had become the sickest industrialized country on the earth and turned it around. <laughs> We're gonna turn it around. It is an America where everyone who works hard can afford a decent life, it is an America where people of all races receive fair and equal treatment under the law. It is an America whose freedoms are the envy of the world. It is an America with honest and transparent government institutions. Can you, can you imagine a country whose government doesn't lie to you? <laughs> People talk about my age. <laughs> it's true. I will be the youngest vice president in American history. <laughs> Let me tell you why so many of us young people have turned away from politics. It's because we lost hope that change would ever come from inside the system. After all, which party wins with promises of hope and change or to drain the swamp? Things proceed as usual, declining bit by bit each pass passing year. So that's the reason. But the other reason is that we can't stand the phoniness anymore. We can't stand the lies. We can't stand the inauthenticity. And that's why Bobby Kennedy leads in all the polls among young people. We are hearing our voice in his. <laughs> so I come to you today as a former Democrat I come to you as a woman not quite 40. I come to you as someone who has experienced sickness and health and poverty and wealth. And I finally, I come to you as a mother. <laughs> you know, most of the philanthropists I work with are women, other mothers. <laughs> And initially, it was a mother who's here today who reached out to inspire support in this campaign. I never thought in a million years I would be up here running for vice president. <laughs> no. No. But what I, I am doing is I'm joining the millions of mothers out there who support this candidacy. <laughs> They are Republicans and Democrats and independents. They read the labels at the supermarkets in order how to keep their kids healthy. <laughs> they watch in anguish, many of them, when their children suffer from chronic disease. They cry silently as their teenagers deal with depression, anxiety, and addiction. 
They do their best to hold it together, and they do because they're freaking strong. <laughs> if you, <laughs> they're my heroes. <laughs> These moms, they're my heroes. They're the moms trying to make a normal life for their children in a world that has gone crazy. As a mother myself who knows the firsthand challenges of raising a child with special needs, I promise to you to make this world a little less crazy. I will work with Bobby Kennedy to make America once again a country of peace, a country of compassion, a country that is prosperous and free, and this, this won't happen overnight, but I have seen miracles that the human spirit can accomplish. I have seen its resilience. And most importantly, I have seen its capacity to heal. <laughs> and what is possible for the human being is also possible for our nation. So please. Join me and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in the healing of America. We've got this. <laughs>